When is it coming out? Where can we see it? <laughs> we know fall. That's all we know. Okay. Now, you're the creator. What made you pick this particular story after, after all the stories that you've done with Hellboy so far? This has... Since I wrote it, this has been my favorite Hellboy story. I got to work with the legendary Richard Corbin, who sadly passed now, but genius of the horror comics world. Uh, it's the creepiest Hellboy story. Uh, it was one of the fastest and easiest and most fun to write. Uh, I just feel like it had everything. I think because I was writing it for Richard, I was I knew he could pull off real spooky mood. So I lean very heavy on the spooky mood stuff. It's less of a fantasy story than, than a, you know, real nuts and bolts horror story very much based on actual Appalachian folklore. So everything about it, uh, including a very weird thing that happened while I was writing it. When I finished writing it, my daughter found a single cat bone in our backyard. Um, that was really an odd moment. In fact, I drew that in the, the front piece to the comic, is that the bone that she found in the backyard. Uh, so that was weird. You um, are awesome. Yeah. You got the exclusive on that one. I haven't told that story. <laughs> nice. There it is. Um, For fans of the comic book, the cat bone you know, plays significantly on the story. Yes. So, um, yeah, it just, everything worked. You know, it, it was everything I wanted Hellboy to be. Uh, and, and when they came to me and said, we're going to do another Hellboy story, I said, if you want me involved, it needs to be the Crooked Man. They needs, better want you involved. Uh, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> well, let's find out. Uh, and they said, okay. And uh, Chris Golden, who's also written a lot of Hellboy with me, uh, we wrote the screenplay together. Because I, one thing I've learned along the way is if I if I can be there at the beginning and put the major pieces together, then other people can come in after me and, and hopefully not dismantle it too much, but I will have provided a skeleton as opposed to coming in after somebody else has made the big decisions and they say, oh, now we want your input. It's, like, it's a little too late. You'll hand you... them a framework and they can, they can uh, yes. pop up. Populated. I mean, they may decide that the leg bone fits better on top of the head. I wouldn't have made that decision. Uh, I put the leg where I thought the leg should go. But, you know, that's what I did. And Brian was actually very respectful, uh, you know, with what we gave him. Can you, Brian, talk a bit about um, the difficulties inherent in, uh, and the joys, of course, of using al almost exclusively practical effects and all the own stunts in the, for this movie? I would say almost exclusively. I would say as much as we could. That's because, great. I mean, because what... Uh, practical effects rules. It really does, but I, I'm, uh, a lot of folks out there might not understand that practical effects are kind of uh, easier to do than CG effects. They're a lot harder and they need a lot more preparation. We made this movie really fast. It's an indie movie, as it should be. And uh, so we did as much practical as we could. Mm -hmm. And the practical stuff is... I mean, it's so cool, you know, it's like... We've seen the teaser trailer, we all agree. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, and even the stuff we did with CG, there was a real effort to not sort of invent uh, exotic purple creatures with lots of tentacles. It's like, this is a spooky things in the woods kind of a movie, right? So we wanted all of our creatures to feel organic to that environment. So it's all based on real animals. Right, so it's a it's a spider, it's a snake. Nobody likes those things, and it's crows. And they and it's the real animal. They may be like a lot, a lot, a lot bigger than the one that you would normally see, but it's based on a real creature. So even the CG stuff, we hope feels more grounded and organic to that world. So the um, the folks that are really reading the comic books and they're really into them, when they watch this movie, are they going to be able to go, oh, that was in the book, because I do that with books. Oh. oh my gosh, that was in the book, or they missed the mark. I have so many favorite moments in that comic, and they're all in the film. That's awesome. And in some cases, they're in the film almost exact. I mean, even... 
some of the angles for certain scenes are it, it was so much closer than I could have imagined. Percentage wise, how much of the comic did it stay, stay true to the comic? How much? Yes. I'd say story wise, feel wise, action wise, I'd say it's 80. Yeah, I don't know if I'd put a percentage on it yeah. so much, but all, all, all I can tell you is. Um, I have a lot of respect for original creators because it's hard and it's, it's a thousand times harder to invent something than it is to riff on it and so to me it, it for something like this with the source material is so beloved uh, and so iconic I would feel ridiculous to come in and sort of like let me just reinvent this and let's just uh, let's just blow this out and turn it into something completely different it's like no the fun of this is having really good source material and trying to capture the essence of it, you know, as, with, as, with as much love as you can. Yeah, you know, that, that was the fun. Yeah, I mean, we knew we had to add certain elements because as, as written originally, The Crooked Man was very much Tom's story that Hellboy just happens to walk into. So, he, of course, you know, one of the things they pointed out is, can you give Hellboy something to do? Uh, so, but that even was a matter of rather than inventing something entirely new, it was borrowing from another Hellboy story and inserting that. So, this story is made of 90% Crooked Man, 10% the Chain Coffin, no other stray elements. Bringing Bobby Joe in, which we weren't asked to do, we decided to do that, invent that new character, who actually just represents all the other stuff that goes on in the Hellboy universe that we don't need to see. We just need him to play off some other character, and you get, without having to see BPRD headquarters and everything else, you understand through her that there's a bigger operation out there. It just doesn't fit into the story, and there's no reason to bring it into this story. Bobby Joe's also a really useful character, uh, because in horror, a lot of what sells the horror is other people's reaction to the horror. Yeah. So when Hellboy sees something monstrous or haunted or bizarre happening, yeah, that's kind of his wheelhouse, you know? Yeah. I mean, look at him when he looks in the mirror. It's, he's used to that kind of stuff. Yeah. So his reaction normally to stuff like that is just pull out a gun and shoot it. You know, let's just shoot this thing. I know what to do with that. Where, so it's, it's Bobby Joe who gets to be the one who's reacting with true horror, like, oh my God. And she's happened? very good at it. Yes, yes. But in fact, Bobby Joe is very much based on another character that I had done in another story. I think it was the second Hellboy story I did where I partnered Hellboy with a young female agent and it was her first field work assignment. So it's she has the biggest arc probably in the story because you see the green agent who is all theory versus oh shit this is what you actually run into in real life. And for you what made Jack the perfect Hellboy? Oh man, well, have you guys talked to him yet? Yes. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it, it should be kind of obvious. So, uh, in his audition tape, the first thing he does is he rolls a cigarette, lights it, smokes it, and eats it lit. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. And I was like, well, that's a good start. I think we found our Hellboy. That's right? yeah. So, he has all of that. He's, he's, I mean, he's an authentically tough guy, and he's very funny. He's very smart. He has this dry, deadpan wit, just like Hellboy. But he also. You can tell when you meet this guy that this guy's lived. He's a young man, but he has seen some stuff. And he's he's got a weight on him. He's got a darkness in him. And it, that's that's Hellboy. You know, Hellboy's a guy who, you know, the wisecracking and the sarcasm covers up pain that's inside him and it covers up gravity and it covers up a real weight that he has to deal with every day when he wakes up. And the beauty of stuff like that is that you don't have to write that because he just brings it. He embodies it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think like if nothing else, I mean, I I think the Hellboy fans are going to love him as Hellboy because he just feels like Hellboy. Now, having him with you, was it difficult or easier to adapt this into a film? Were you actually on set? I was not. Uh, we actually, we actually banned him from the set. <laughs> I would have. 